Peace. Introducing Staying Alive with Dana Hamill. Dana has been in the medical community for over 15 years and is ready to bring the latest and greatest in the medical community. Each week, Dana will interview different doctors in different fields and will offer you, the public, to call in and ask questions that you need answers to. Call into the show, 888-565-1470, and feel free to ask the doctors any questions that you may have. All shows can be seen on amp2.tv or the wwnnradio.com website. Now, it's time to get informed. Here's Dana Hamill. Good evening. My name is Dana Hamill, and you are listening to Staying Alive, the talk show designed to bring you the latest in what's happening in medicine. Before we get started tonight, I wanted to quickly introduce myself. I have been part of the medical wellness community for many years, and I wanted to create a show where listeners could hear local doctors be interviewed on the hot topics in medicine. My goal is to provide a place that makes medicine easy to understand and to help us all stay healthy and feel more alive. If you would like to call in tonight, we'd love to hear from you. You can reach us at 888-565-1470. Our topic tonight is heart health, which is very appropriate since February is American Heart Month. Why is heart health such an important topic and why does it get its own month? Because heart disease is the leading cause of death for men and women in the United States. Every year, one in four deaths are caused by heart disease. To tell us more about what we should be aware of when it comes to heart health, I am pleased to welcome Dr. Joseph Friedman. Good evening, and thank you for having me here. Our pleasure. Dr. Friedman is an acclaimed cardiologist who is board certified in five separate cardiology specialties and has an office in Lauderdale Lakes with Tenant Florida Physician Services. Dr. Friedman is also on staff at the Florida Medical Center in Fort Lauderdale. Dr. Friedman, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And as you mentioned, it is the last day of Heart Month, so uh, one last chance to get some heart-healthy knowledge out there to the listeners. Before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Certainly. I am a practicing cardiologist at uh, Florida Medical Center, which is part of the Tenant Florida Physician Services Heart and Vascular Network, a network of 10 hospitals along the uh, southeast coast of Florida. Uh, we practice cutting-edge, state-of-the-art cardiology at our hospital, and uh, we run the gamut of all the medical needs of cardiology, from diagnostics to prevention to care of heart failure, coronary disease, rhythm problems, surgical cures, and everything in between. What made you decide to become a cardiologist? Well, in medical school, what appealed to me the most, the organ systems that I thought were the most fascinating were the, the eyes, the brain, and the heart. Mm -hmm. And as I studied them more in great detail, the brain, it was sort of like a black box to nowhere. Things went in, things went out, <laughs> but to relate as a doctor to how to cure things in between it was very very subjective and with vision fixing the eye is an amazing miracle but you can never tell what the other person sees True. with the heart the heart is very simply a mechanical pump with a bunch of pipes and valves and an electrical system very similar to the engine of a car okay and it's something that we can interface with very easily with all of our medical imaging with EKGs, we can actually see the electrical pulses of the heart and diagnose problems. We can change the way the heart moves. I think, I think something that really, really catalyzed my interest in studying cardiology was we had a very weak heart where one side was wounded in a, in a damage in a heart attack and it wasn't beating in sync with the other side. And therefore the pumping of the heart was very ineffective and the patient was having a lot of heart failure symptoms. And with ultrasound and a very fancy pacemaker with multiple leads, we were actually able to program the way the heart was beating and actually see the walls resynchronize and beat in unison and, and increase the pumping capacity of the heart by about 20%. So when I saw how the heart was a very simple but elegant machine, but there were so many ways to interact with it and get positive direct outcomes for patients, it was just the, the winner for me over everything else in medicine and what I ended up doing for, for my career. It sounds like you have a passion for it, which you don't always hear, so that's, that's nice. How can patients identify a good cardiologist? What should they look for? What questions should they be asking? Are there certain tells? Well, cardiology in itself is, is a broad field with multiple subspecialties. So within cardiology, we have the general cardiologist, the cardiologist that puts stents in people, which is the interventional cardiologist. We have the cardiologist that deals with pacemakers and rhythm problems, which is the electrophysiologist. Now there are heart failure and transplant specialists. And each of these pathways are extra years of training. 
Uh, my recommendation is someone start with a cardiologist like me, a general cardiologist who comes from one of the top institutions, okay. someplace that's practicing evidence-based medicine that has a long-standing career of research and uh, works in the leading trials so that the doctor has a lot of experience already out of training in the medications, in all the treatment modalities. Usually the latest and greatest imaging, very expensive equipment is only available in the major academic medical centers. Uh, in some ways, having a younger doctor, newer to the field like me, I probably am more aware of a lot of the technologies and procedures than some of the doctors that have been in the field 20 years longer than me. And uh, having somebody exposed to the latest and greatest uh, devices out there in cardiology, every year there are so many new things coming out that can really make an impact on patients. It's important to be involved with a doctor that is staying current and up to date with all of the, all of the new things coming out in cardiology. I didn't realize that cardiology was so technology dependent. It sounds like that's one of the main factors and to kind of be aware of is, is if your doctor is aware of all the latest stuff that's available. That's right. Just in my field of, of general cardiology and imaging, we do imaging based on x-rays, based on ultrasounds, based on MRI, based on nuclear, based on PET, where it's a whole subset of radiology within cardiology and knowing the right test for the right symptom for the right patient and how to interpret the test properly, not to overread artifacts, how to minimize any unnecessary procedures. Obviously, an ethical cardiologist that's looking to minimize radiation exposure to a mm -hmm. patient, any unnecessary treatments to a patient. I like to keep my patients on as minimal amount of medication as possible for the lowest possible cost, really working for the benefit of the patient. What are the signs that someone should be aware of when, they, when something should click in their mind and say, oh my gosh, I really need to make an appointment with a cardiologist. I really need to go see someone who's a specialist. Well, that's a great question. And as you said before, somewhere between one third to one quarter of, of all fatalities or mor mortalities in the United States is from cardiovascular disease. This is a very s quiet, insidious disease. It's a disease that involves risk factors such as hypertension, diabetes, diseases like high cholesterol, things people may not even know they have. They may never have been screened for it. And little by little over the years, all these processes take their wear and tear on the arteries, on the heart. And sometimes, wham, the big one can happen before someone even knew that they were a candidate. Now, if you're lucky enough to start getting symptoms, the symptoms clearly to look out for are chest pain, especially with any kind of exertion or exercise. Okay. Usually when you have a narrowed vessel, the heart needs more blood when it's pumping faster with exercise. When the blood starts to get through these narrowed vessels at, at exercise with exertion, feeling some kind of pressure, possibly radiating to one of, the, one of the arms or the jaw or the shoulders. These are all the classic signs of chest pain or angina. Shortness of breath, being winded, a decrease in exercise tolerance, coughing, dry cough or coughing up fluids, noticing swelling in the abdomen or legs, all these can be signs and symptoms of some type of change in the cardiovascular status. Like most females, I was under the impression that heart disease mostly affects men and it was something I didn't need to worry too, too much about, but that's not true, is it? Sure. I mean, the, the traditional disease that's been highlighted the most in, in women is breast cancer, which mm -hmm. is about one in eight women and cardiovascular disease really doesn't discriminate between men and women especially after menopause when women's hormonal levels change they lose some of the cardioprotective benefits of estrogen specifically and the lipid profile changes blood pressure typically rises and women are having just as many heart attacks as men unfortunately these classic symptoms i described before uh -huh. very typically do not occur in women mm -hmm. and they can feel pain maybe lower in the epigastric area May, maybe not have any symptoms at all, but it's very important that anyone with a family history of heart disease, a history of smoking, anyone with known high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, all be evaluated, hopefully by the age of 40, by a cardiologist, and certainly thereafter on a regular basis. Do you think everyone at their 40th birthday should go and visit a cardiologist? I think everybody should have some basic set of tests that uh, they're, they're doing cholesterol tests now. I have, I have children that are in second and fourth grade, and I already heard their pediatrician was starting to do cholesterol tests on them. But any kind of screening of, of blood pressure, blood sugar, and cholesterol should be happening routinely and often. And if someone has managed to avoid a 
healthcare professional by the age of 40 certainly <laughs> is the time to uh, start finding out if there are any cardiac risk factors cooking. Would those tests typically happen with your family practitioner and then they would determine if you should go on to see a cardiologist or should someone just call a cardiologist directly and most typically the basic screening comes from the family practitioner okay. and we usually get referrals for patients with stubborn to control blood pressure patients that mm -hmm. have an EKG that the that that is rated as abnormal patients that are on multiple cholesterol medications and and the cholesterol is not going down effectively um, I would say patients that have a history of anyone in their family having heart attacks between the ages of 30 and 50 or very high cholesterols over 300 should certainly be seen by a cardiologist, possibly even right away. I understand that you specialize in preventative cardiology. What exactly does that mean? Well, preventative cardiology is really utilizing the latest medications and imaging equipment and really trying to figure out when we sort of hit the fork in the road. and. Of course, the medical system in the United States, Western medicine in general, is really designed to fix a, a broken machine. There's not a, lot of, there's not a lot of influence in trying to keep people healthy. And yeah. what, one thing we want to do in cardiology is certainly identify who is at risk of heart attack, stroke, kidney failure, any kind of cardiovascular implication, any patient that we find that has already metabolic syndrome, which is a cluster of obesity, high blood pressure, lipid abnormalities. These are all patients we want to start to treat early. We want to start influencing them to live a healthier lifestyle. So stage one would be a diet and exercise regimen mm -hmm. that can probably correct about half of the cardiovascular disease in its earliest forms that we, that we see. Moving on to that, we want to make sure that people are on the minimum amount of medicine they need for lipid reduction, cholesterol reduction, and blood pressure reduction. And we want to start doing some diagnostic tests to identify who already has quietly built up inside them disease that already needs to be intervened in and possibly treated more aggressively before something bad happens. You mentioned diet being a huge factor. I think we all know this, but there's a giant trend right now for the low-carb, high-protein diets, which Admittedly, they help keep people thin, right. which I imagine is good for heart, but is the diet itself, which typically the high proteins oftentimes mean high fat. Correct. So Correct. tell me how this works in the heart world. So I get a lot of questions about diet. Yeah. So, so the, the painful truth and, oh God, and the answer to most of our problems, uh -huh. and this is why people like, for example, in Okinawa, Japan, never had any cardiovascular disease until the Americans built a McDonald's there. Oh. And this is why horses and cows never get heart attacks, essentially. Okay. What we need to realize, and this comes from a very famous book called uh, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease by a Dr. Celestin, who's a heart, a heart surgeon at Cleveland Clinic where I trained. He says, do not eat anything that has a face or a mother. So essentially, this Paleolithic type diet, these Atkins diet, uh -huh. anything that influences a lot of protein, well, yeah. all meat pretty much has a lot of fat and cholesterol in it. Certainly, all meat from cows, goats, pigs one could argue chicken breast and certain fish mm -hmm. you can probably eat on the safer side but really a diet that's low in carbs will cause some immediate weight loss but yeah. what it does to the lipid profile what it does to your overall heart healthiness I mean the only thing and this goes back to these Dean Ornish diet trials 40 50 years ago the only thing that's really been proven to reverse the buildup of plaque inside the arteries and really clean out the pipes is vegan diet wow vegetarianism plant-based diet plant sterile salad things like that i mean omega-3 has been proven to help the heart a lot so uh -huh. the fattier fish like salmon when you can find what's hard to find out good healthy salmon low yeah. in toxins and mercury uh chicken breast not the dark meat where all the fat usually <laughs> clusters <laughs> for some protein po protein with tofu protein with beans um limiting the, the foods that have high glycemic starch-like indexes, the, the white breads, the white rice. Really, this can make a huge difference in patients. Patients could theoretically come off all or most of their medications if they truly, really adhered to a vegan diet. 
How difficult is it to turn a meat eater into a vegan for health reasons? It only takes one big heart attack and a week in the hospital. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Kicks the smoking habit for a lot of people, too. I know Bill Clinton says he's doing it now, and, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's looking pretty lean and mean. Yes, he's actually looking really good. Um, when, it come, when we hear a lot about pulmonary hypertension... Um, I came across that when I was doing some research, and I kept hearing about it. What is that? And, and Well, I'm glad you asked me about that. That's a rare cluster of disease processes, which I'd like to certainly highlight. I am probably the only cardiologist in central and eastern Broward that treats this disease, and it requires a, a, a separate subset of knowledge and uh, medications that are very complicated to use. But essentially, the right side of the heart... Okay. The main job of the right side of the heart is to collect all the blood from the body, from the brain, from the legs, from all the organs, and return it to the heart and pump it to the lungs. And that's where the air exchange occurs. We eliminate the carbon dioxide we've stored up in the blood, and we bring in the new oxygen. So the heart, in the right side of the heart, the ventricle, that big meaty bottom part of the heart, pumps the blood through a big pipe called the pulmonary artery. Okay. So there is a disease process that occurs through numerous different things such as left-sided heart failure, emphysema, where the lungs themselves are bad. Anything that makes it harder for the blood on the right side of the heart to pump through that pipe, pump through the lungs, that gets the heart cannot respond to that pressure, and the right side of the heart starts to dilate and weaken, and that artery starts to thicken and get stiffer, and the hole in it smaller, which compounds the right side of the heart having the ability to get blood through there. Uh, to make it even more mysterious, there is a whole entity called pulmonary hypertension, primary pulmonary hypertension, where there is no explanation from the lungs or the left side of the heart where this is coming from, and it's just one of these out-of-the-blue diseases that just hits most, mostly women in about 75% of the case, and all of a sudden that pulmonary artery gets very thick, and it hypertrophies, which means the muscle inside it gets thick, and it gets very hard for that right side of the heart to pump blood to the lungs, causing all sorts of problems, right heart failure, risk of blood clots, and unfortunately, if not treated, early death. What can be done? What are the treatment options? Is it surgery? Well, first we have to understand one of the five causes of why a patient has pulmonary hypertension. Now, okay. interestingly enough, in the Western world, the most common cause is probably left heart failure. But in the entire developing world, actually, the most common cause of pulmonary hypertension, of all things, is, is a worm infestation called schistosomiasis. Oh, my gosh. And patient, people walk through rivers in Africa, in, in, in India, and little worms crawl, <laughs> literally crawl inside their bodies through their feet. And for whatever reason, they like to live inside that pulmonary artery and reproduce and lay eggs. And literally, the heart and that pipe get clustered and clogged up with burden of worms and eggs and as disgusting as oh it sounds that is the leading cause of pulmonary hypertension in the developing world here we worry more about people that have long-standing smoking history mm -hmm. people that have weak left hearts so as the left heart fails the fluid backs up and puts more pressure on the right heart but a lot of young women that mysteriously present with shortness of breath and there's nothing in their lungs like pneumonia or fluid to explain it People that have diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus tend to get this more often. Okay. It's a disease that we can investigate with ultrasound by putting little catheters in the heart and measuring the pressures. But when we diagnose it, we do know that very high doses of combination medication, very similar to chemotherapy, are showing to aggressively treat the disease and delay the progression of the artery getting thicker and stiffer. Does stress levels have much to do with um, heart health? In, in regards to all the different diseases? In, in the relations to some of them, there's been some soft linkages that it has. There, typically, the type A personality has been the type that gets heart attacks more. That's what we think of, yeah. We, we've noticed there's a phenomenon that's actually called the stress heart attack, where patients present with changes on their EKG, chest pain, everything that looks just like a real heart attack. It's also called broken heart syndrome. In Japanese, it's called Takatsubo syndrome because the heart takes the dilated shape of like an octopus, and that's the word in Japan for the bucket that they would catch octopus in when they would go fishing. Okay. But it's basically when the poets of yore spoke of people dying of a broken heart, there is a phenomenon where stress can cause the heart to literally deform, break down, and act like a heart attack's happening. When we go in to look for any kind of blockages breaking off, which is 
how a typical heart attack happens, we see nothing. The arteries are very clear. But stress can cause heart attacks. Mm -hmm. Stress can cause plaques to break at a quicker rate than people that are not stressed. Okay. All sorts of studies have been done showing things like meditation, stress reduction, laughing, religion, being in a good, loving relationship, all seem to facilitate people having less heart attacks. Uh, we don't quite know the mechanism for this yet. It could be related to the release of catecholamines, endorphins in, in the blood, affecting the muscle of the heart. Stress has not really been linked to pulmonary hypertension, which is more of a mechanical disease. Mm -hmm. But we do see that people that are very stressed and anxious have higher blood pressure and certainly more heart attacks. When you suggest things like meditation and things like, oh, maybe you need to change your home environment or change your life, how open are people to making some of these changes? Well, it's probably the hardest thing to do in medicine is lifestyle changes. Yeah. But again, going back to things like simply diet and exercise, mm -hmm. this would cure the majority of cardiovascular disease in this country. With the exceptions wow. of very few genetic processes, this is a disease that we give to ourselves. We are pretty much all born with clean pipes, Mm -hmm. And as long as the blood's flowing through those pipes and everything's nice and clean, you don't get cardiovascular disease. Car what is cardiovascular disease? It is the buildup of cholesterol plaques, mostly the byproducts of the foods we're eating that are too high in cholesterol for our body to clear out. And we literally just gook up our pipes. It's like plumbing. We, we gook up the pipes. And can we reverse it with diet, with exercise? To some degree, we can. And we know from autopsies done back in... Vietnam, where they were autopsying 19-year-old soldiers who were killed in Vietnam. These 19-year-olds already had cholesterol buildup in their arteries. So this is something, wow. even back then, when people probably ate, ate healthier, healthier, is just a phenomenon that it's, it's just a, it's one of the downsides of being a human being. We have a, a very natural defense mechanism to clear out our pipes called the good cholesterol, mm -hmm. HDL cholesterol. But when we, when we overwhelm that with just blasting our bodies with so much food all day that's the type that's high in cholesterol and saturated fats we overwhelm our body's ability to eradicate the the gook out of our pipes and we literally once we clog up those pipes then we start to break off little pieces of them and that's causing heart attacks when it flies down the arteries in the heart that's causing strokes when it flies up into the arteries in the brain mm -hmm. and it's just a simple plumbing, mechanical type disease that we essentially do to ourselves, and we are the ones that are best suited to undo it to ourselves. And so once again, just because someone has a fit looking body, they might be slender, they might be, you know, working out at the gym, that doesn't necessarily mean they have a healthy heart. No, I mean, to make things even more mysterious, 25% of the heart attacks we see have normal cholesterols on a standard cholesterol blood test. Wow. Uh, the liver makes the majority of the cholesterol in the body. Uh -huh. It's even more than that we get from our diet. So patients that have a genetic propensity to have high cholesterol from a genetic disorder that runs through their liver, and these are patients that usually have strong family histories of heart disease and diseases that are called the hypercholesterolemia syndromes. I've seen people literally tan, wiry with muscles with their sweatbands on, come off the tennis court, clutching their chest. And I remember I saw one guy once, I thought he was joking. He came in on the stretcher. He was the fittest look. I, I said, what are you doing here? Yeah, what are you doing here? <laughs> He's like, I have chest pain. What do you think I'm doing here? <laughs> he was having a rip-roaring heart attack. Oh We've seen gosh. it in young women, especially after a delivery. Uh, pregnancy and delivery puts a lot of stress on the body, and a separate mechanism of actual dissection of the lining of the coronary artery can occur. So 25, 30-year-old women come in with chest pain. You cannot rule anything out. Sometimes they're having a heart attack, and it's there are, there are multiple mechanisms, but the, the try-and-true reason most people have heart attacks, and most people die. And, and this reminds me of something that the teacher told me once in biochemistry in medical school. You know, I, I went to medical school in Israel where there's a lot going on, and you're thinking about people dying from stabbings and gunshots and missiles. And he said the thing that kills the most people in the Western world is fat in our blood. Mm. That's what's doing it. And, it. and most of us are putting it there ourselves, and... The big takeaway, and I've spoken a lot during this month to people, is know your risk. If you haven't been taking good care of yourself, there's a death every 30 seconds in this country just about from a heart attack. Check, Get yourself checked out. Know your risk. Know what the risk is of you having a heart attack. With some people, the five-year risk is extremely low, less than 1%. 
Certain people over 10% need to be on aspirin, statin pills. They must be on these medications. These medications have been proven to save lives. All right, so now that you've taken all my meat away, my friend asked me to ask, is it really too we all get to drink more red wine? All right, so <laughs> alcohol has been a fascination of doctors for the longest time, and uh, especially when it comes to the heart. Uh, the, it goes back hundreds of years, but there is a famous doctor in Ireland who, who noticed that all the people that, of course, drank a lot of alcohol in Ireland were having heart attacks. And in France, the doctors were never reporting any cases of heart attacks. And I think he really came out with the early sort of conclusion that there was this, this paradox to the French. And why are the French living longer and having less heart attacks even though they consume alcohol? They drink red wine. So what is it about red wine that seems to be the magic potion here? And of course, too much alcohol is never good, but red wine has in it resveratrol, which is a compound in the skin of the grape, which is a natural antioxidant. And to make a long story short, too much oxygen causes free radicals, which damages DNA in the blood and can essentially facilitate the bad cholesterol burrowing deeper into the lining of the arteries and building up plaque. Okay. And as we drink red wine, we actually lower the, the free radicals and do a bit of a detoxification. There's also a link to wine lowering blood pressure, raising HDL cholesterol, and an overall calming effect, which lowers stress. Right now, we're going to go ahead and take a commercial break, and we'll be back. are tough and right now those in the commercial world know that being heard via advertisements is the name of the game ampsquare.tv understands how important advertisement is and is proud to express that it's truly the only plugged in internet television production company on the market amp2.tv live streams all their shows across all the major selling markets in the u.s and abroad call them at 866-224-5422 the AmpSquare.tv library allows productions to be seen over and over again, making commercial platforms more usable. Call 866-224-5422. Toll free 866-224-5422. Amp2.tv, the first and only internet television network that's truly plugged in. 866-224-5422. That's A-M-P, the number two, dot TV. You are listening to Stayin' Alive with Dana Hamill, who has been in the medical community for over 15 years. If you want to call into the show, call 888-565-1470 and ask Dana about anything you want more information on. Now, back to our show. Yeah, it's 24 hours a day. All right, we were talking about red wine, and I can't let the topic go. So the question then is, how much? So how much wine, there's some linkage to body size you know obviously a very large man could probably tolerate a little more wine than a very petite woman but we're looking at essentially one to two glasses of red wine a day we want to avoid too much alcohol because eventually in very high doses of course alcohol is a poison to the liver and even to the heart itself mm -hmm. and uh you know uh, it is a drug of sorts so everything everything in limits but everyone Every, all the studies done on red wine, while some of the mechanisms are still unclear to the actual biochemical benefit it has on the body, it all shows that it is linked to higher good cholesterol and lower incidence of heart attack. And white wine doesn't get any of the kudos. White well, wine is just... White wine has less of the good resveratrol antioxidant as red wine, but white wine has it, and some nuts have it, and it's, it's out there. Anything with a flavonoid, uh, dark chocolate has it. Okay. It's, it's found in that as well, and there are some antioxidant properties to that. Do you have to drink the organic wines or the expensive wines, or even is the grocery store wine just fine? You can drink whatever suits your palate. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, does binge drinking hurt the heart? Binge drinking in and of itself is really more toxic to the brain. The, okay. All the studies that have been done on how alcohol affects the heart 
really show that it takes something like 10 years of drinking heavy amounts of al alcohol for the heart muscle itself to actually become poisoned. And don't think that's so hard to do because I have had patients that have severe alcoholic heart disease and it, the heart takes on a very classic dilated thinned out look. Again, mm -hmm. the mechanism is it causing cells within the heart to really self-destruct, which is a process called apoptosis or is the breakdown of some of the products of alcohol as it's metabolized in the blood, like acetaldehyde, the direct toxin to some of the powerhouses like the mitochondria inside the cells, we're not exactly sure, but heavy, heavy amounts of alcohol cause the heart to deform and become weak. But the studies have also shown that three months of abstinence, some of these hearts are already showing marked improvement. Nice, but it's hard to know what heavy is heavy for one person is not heavy for another right so there's is, right. is there a gauge i would say two drinks a day is about the minimum the american heart association puts it probably at about one to two ounces of alcohol you okay. know that's that's two two mixed drinks for a man um maybe two glasses of wine for the average size female two beers you know i i've had patients that drink literally 28 beers a day or more and you will first of all wonder how someone has so much time to drink that. Of course, <laughs> after that, I always ask them if they recycle because they could be rich. But uh, yeah, uh, two drinks a day, You're that's fine. enough. That's enough. Any more, that falls into the heavy drinking category. Heavier drinking. Heavier drinking. Okay. If you had to pick, which is worse for the heart, the heavy drinking or heavy smoking? Smoking is the worst thing you could do for the heart. By Absolutely. Far. Absolutely. It's estimated that smoking doubles your risk of heart attack. Like I said, there is a few good things you can say about moderate alcohol consumption. There's okay. really nothing good you can say about smoking. Smoking is just a toxin. You're inhaling compounds. Not only are you literally frying out the insides of your lungs, which have the consistency of something like cotton candy. So imagine just taking a, a thing of cotton candy and lighting it on fire and then wondering how you're going to breathe after that happens. But it does accelerate the atherosclerotic process. It destabilizes the lining of the vessels. It really is the single worst risk factor and the worst thing you could do for your cardiovascular health. With so many states then legalizing marijuana, both medical and recreational, do we know if the smoke from marijuana affects us in the same way that the smoke from cigarette does? Well, I think the jury is still hung on that one. Of course, the proponents of marijuana only speak its praises, and I'm certain there is a role for marijuana in, in certain cases for intractable pain, and uh, maybe certain anxiety syndromes, but inhaling any compound into the lungs just just cannot be good. Cannot we be don't good. know the sources of all like, commercial grade marijuana may be one day guaranteed some level of cleanliness, but nowadays if you go buy a joint off some guy on the corner, you don't know what you're buying, what it's laced with. Yeah. Uh, what it was grown with, what pesticides yeah, are in it. It's, I, I know that there's probably a lot of very pro-marijuana people out there, um, but the trials I've seen link marijuana still to, to emphysema, the same as tobacco cigarettes and certain types of memory loss and confusion, and personally it's something that I would stay away from. And then there's the whole issue of it being a gateway drug to things that could be much more dangerous for, for a person to take. The proponents of the marijuana say that there haven't been any documented cases. Is that just because it hasn't been studied yet? And why hasn't it been? Well, it's been an illegal substance. So, you know, getting people to voluntarily admit that they're doing something illegal for a trial probably would be difficult to do. I'm, I'm sure that, you know, as society liberalizes the use of marijuana and legalizes it, it will become something that we'll study more and more often. And we'll see. We'll see what can be done with it. I mean, the... The traditionalists have spoken of the power of the herb for quite some time, but personally, I, I abstain. You mentioned earlier that menopause can affect the risk for heart disease. Um, is there something that women can do? Should they be taking the, um, uh, the, the estrogen or doing something along those lines to help offset that? Well, that's an excellent question. First of all, I would say that I would only work on that type of patient in conjunction with their gynecologist and okay. someone who's very well versed in, in the patient and how serious their symptoms are. There's, of course, a risk benefit to everything. There are certain types of birth control that for women with very severe symptoms of menopause and dysfunctional bleeding, a progesterone only pill has a very, very weak 
correlation to increase heart attack risk, increase blood clot risk. Estrogen pills or estrogen progesterone combo pills seem to be a little riskier as, as to the risk of developing breast cancer in these pills. Again, I would defer some of this to a gynecologist, but I believe the data is something like 8 out of 10,000 women get additional breast cancer from hormone replacement therapy. But we certainly worry about smoking with these pills. There is a marked wow. increase in blood clots forming in the legs, which could then go up into the lungs and cause serious problems there. These are called pulmonary emboli. And um, women that, that do have hormone replacement, we do see a slight reduction in cardiovascular events. We think that it does help their blood pressure stay down, and it does affect their lipid profile in a positive way, keeping the bad LDL cholesterol lower and the good HDL cholesterol higher. I know that for some women, they've been on birth control pills or the patch for literally decades. Is that okay in regards to heart health? Again, I think there's not a lot of data that these medications make the heart at markedly higher risk. Uh -huh. It's marginal, and really it becomes an individual case-by-case risk-benefit analysis. Certainly, we know things like smoking, diabetes, and long-standing high blood pressure are much more indicative of potential heart attack risk than people on birth control pills. When I was doing my research, um, I came a lot across coronary artery disease. Um, what is that exactly, and is it preventable? So coronary artery disease is known by a lot of different things. Atherosclerosis, like we were talking before about build up in the pipes mm -hmm. that, that carry blood to the organs in the body. So everything coming out of the heart goes out the left side of the heart. All the blood is carried out through the aorta, which is the largest vessel in the body and pumps blood through various branches to the brain, to the arms, to the legs, to all the organs. And right at the origin of the aorta are two little holes, which we call the coronary osteum, where the coronary, coronary arteries come from. And these are the arteries that carry blood to the heart muscle itself. Okay. So blockages in these tiny little arteries are what causes the heart attack. Just like blockages in the arteries to the neck cause stroke, or blockages in the arteries to the leg can cause some kind of peripheral disease and an ischemic limb. But when we talk about heart attacks, we have three coronary arteries, the left anterior descending, which is the main artery that supplies the largest amount of blood to the greatest area of the heart, and a blockage at the top of that artery impacts the greatest amount of the heart at once, and that's why oh, traditionally it's been called the widow maker, if you get a blockage right there. Um, those heart attacks are usually massive, and if those patients aren't brought to a hospital with a cath lab very quickly, that could mean instant death. Um, smaller arteries go to the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart, and these blockages in these arteries can be very dangerous too. Specifically, the right side of the heart supplies blood to all the electrical system of the heart. And that is a very intricate and fascinating system in and of itself. And why is that so important? Anytime part of the heart is starved for blood from a heart attack, that entire part of the heart loses its normal electrical pulsation that causes the heartbeat. And that can destabilize all the electricity in the heart and call, cause a lethal arrhythmia called ventricular fibrillation, which is what you see people getting defibrillated for in, in the movies. Yeah. If, if once the heart is in that defibrillation type, it loses all its ability to pump, blood is lost to the brain, and death will ensue within two to four minutes. So one of the co main causes of what we call sudden death, when people just drop to the ground, is really an electrical disturbance kicked off by an actual blockage, not getting blood to the part of the heart where that electricity is supposed to be going. So is that the time frame that if a heart stops pumping, you have approximately two to four minutes to get it pumping again, either Everything has or to be manually? done fast. The guidelines for um, ACLS, which is the Advanced Cardiac Life Support, have really moved the focus from breathing into the lungs to simply immediately starting chest compressions and taking over that blood. We're trying to save the brain. Okay. The brain is really what goes the fastest. So it's not about just getting the heart pumping. It is about right. getting that blood pumped right. up to the we brain. Can, we can, the heart is just a pump. It's oh. just, it, we can pump you with a device that they put on in an ambulance. Uh -huh. it's a, the, the only job of the heart is to move blood through the body to the vital organs. And why is blood so important? Blood contains all the oxygen, which all cells need to live. Blood contains all the food as it moves out of our intestines. Blood contains all the hormones. Blood contains our immune system. 
but the heart when you think about it we can replace it with a metallic device it's really just a pump nothing more but god forbid there's one little problem with it the entire organ systems of the entire body destabilize very quickly so resuscitation now involves augmenting the heart pumping and as soon as you can early and rapid defibrillation how effective is CPR? I think I remember learning it like once in seventh grade, and then I haven't had any exposure to it since. It's extremely important, extremely simple, extremely safe, and extremely effective. Oh, and and okay. good quality CPR can make the difference of certainly keeping someone alive until EMS providers can be on scene. Mm -hmm. If there is a defibrillator nearby, early defibrillation literally stops all the electricity in the heart that was destabilizing and lets the natural heartbeat take over. That could be life-saving if done in the field, but certainly just good chest compressions can keep vital blood going to the brain. So once a patient is successfully resuscitated, there will be full brain function. You look to be in great shape. What do you do to stay heart healthy? Well, in my job, I see the results of people not staying heart healthy. <laughs> so uh, maybe out of some kind of sheer panic, I, I'm addicted now to exercise. My uh, ability and tastes and preferences have evolved with age but uh -huh. right now I've become somewhat of an amateur triathlete and really focus on cardiovascular uh, I do a lot of swimming biking and running usually early in the morning before work and before all the kids get up nice and I tr you know I, I wish I could do two three four hours of it a day but right now I'm just focusing on about 30 minutes of, of one sport most days of the week mm -hmm. to the highest intensity that I can do whether it's a 30 minute run a 30 minute swim a 30 minute bike or going to the gym for 30 minutes and I'm exercising six days six days of the week impressive so you you follow the you you have to the routine you have to. <laughs> and diet are you a vegetarian as I'm you propone almost a vegetarian I okay. probably eat zero to one serving of red meat a month Wow I, I really avoid it fast food I avoid uh -huh. um, I do have a lot of fish uh, salmon tilapia cod all the all the fatty fish high in omega-3 I'll, I'll have chicken breast once or twice a week but uh one of the one of the best ways i've known to get patients to lose weight with diet is really just eat a lot of salad uh especially okay. at the beginning of the meal because That's once easy. you fill up on salad and maybe a glass of water and half of your stomach is already full on something very low calories very healthy very cardiac neutral then you'll already limit the bad stuff that you'll even have the hunger to to consume so for the ladies who lunch, a salad and a glass of red wine is, a, is approved? Ideal. Just, nice. just do what they do in, in Europe. The, the Mediterranean diet is still the recommended diet by the uh, American Heart Association. And are we allowed chocolate cake for dessert, or does it have to be just a piece of dark chocolate? Again, everything in moderation. Okay. You know, five pieces of chocolate cake a day would be bad, uh -huh. but you know, we only live once. You have to, you have, to have a little fun out there. <laughs> I see here that you are also trilingual. What languages do you speak? Well, I speak English, obviously, uh -huh. and uh, I speak Hebrew, mostly from my Impressive. past life of living in Israel. I went to medical school in Israel, and uh, I have a lot of family there, so we were continually going there when I was younger. Oh, very cool. And being that most of my medical training was in Miami and in South Florida, I learned Spanish pretty much on the job. Wow. And that was a necessity. I think a third of my patients do not speak English and are primarily Spanish speakers. I'm sure that helps you a ton in your practice. Absolutely. In, in Israel, too, being able to communicate, you know, everybody speaks English, but being able to communicate with anyone in their own language and knowing a bit of the nuances of how they express themselves and when maybe they're hiding something from you. And, mm. you know, you, you need to be able to really know everything about somebody. Uh, the one person you don't want to have secrets from is your doctor. Yeah. How was medical school in Israel? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? that well, it was, it was a very dynamic um, experience. Israel follows really the British system of medical education, which every country in the United States, except the United States and Canada, follow. Most people don't even go to college. You go straight to medical school. And it's a very focused education. Israel has cutting-edge hospitals. There's obviously a lot of trauma there, but also a lot of innovation many 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 of the medical devices we use here are all invented by israeli doctors really? many of the doctors i work with were nobel prize winners i work with the doctor that invented the the little capsule pill people swallow to take pictures of their intestine 
I worked with doctors that won Nobel Prizes in chemistry, doctors that invented many of the cardiac devices and imaging systems that we use. Uh, my brother-in-law has patents out for calcium scoring, for, for CT scans, which is a modality that I use today, okay. all developed in Haifa. Um, we, we, ha we had a very advanced medical system there and always looking forward to anything that could happen unexpectedly in terms of mass casualties. Israel is a leader in disaster assistance, oh. mass casualty assistance. They're always sending the military medical team out to places where there's been earthquakes. They were in Haiti. They were in Nepal. Um, they're, they're, they're pioneering studies now in preventing people from getting radiation sickness from dirty bombs, wow. which could be a lifesaver if, God forbid, there's any terrorist attack in the future. And... Uh, the, the, the medical system there, it's very, very open. I mean, it, I don't know what preconceived notions people have about Israel and the Middle East in general, but there is a big plaque in our medical school that medical science is do devoted to all humanity. We had Jewish students there. We had Muslim students there. We had oh. Christian students there. One quarter of one of the wards in my hospital in downtown Tel Aviv was all Arab patients from Gaza that came to get treatments in Israel that they could not get in Gaza, and had they not gotten the treatments in Israel, they would probably have died. Advanced cancer therapies, heart attack therapies. So all this is going on all the time. There's, there's certainly a level of peaceful coexistence and cooperation in the Israeli scientific and medical community, and it's a shame to see that so many academic institutions still have a problem uh, affiliating with Israel on some levels, because without the technology that was in innovated there, many of what we have here now to offer our patients wouldn't exist. Who in Israel is paying for these, to, to invest in these technologies or to research these technologies? Is it the government that's making these investments? There are people that basically get into private companies, raise capital. Right now, Israel is the third largest company with NASDAQ, a country with NASDAQ companies listed after uh -huh. the U.S. and Canada. So there's a lot of venture capital pouring into Israel. Uh, all the leading IT companies are there. Uh -huh. Microsoft has a huge focus there, uh, Intel. There's, there's a whole corridor of, of, of Israel near where my hospital was that looks just like Silicon Valley. And it's one high-tech U.S. company after another employing thousands of people there that are really doing some of the latest cutting-edge research in biomedical and IT. I'm sure most of the world does not even realize that. It's a shame, but probably not. But... Uh, that's, that's what's going on. I mean, the downside is they're, they're always aware that something could happen. Many, many floors of our hospital were built deep underground. The, uh -huh. surg the surgical wings were all effectively in bunkers. They stockpiled years of medical supplies in case something happens. But, uh, you know, I worked with doctors that there were not only doctors, but on the side flew F-16s in the Army. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, were, were involved in search and rescue crews and were flying in Black Hawk helicopters rescuing down soldiers in behind enemy lines and picking them up and bringing them back to the OR. It's it's a whole other level of reality over there, and and the medical system has really risen to the challenge to to support that. And in your opinion, it's because of this very traumatic history that these advances have been able to be made. Right, Israel has always had very little natural resources and a very tough neighborhood to live in. So just the ingenuity of the people the audacity of some of the military missions that, that they're famous for, um, just thinking outside the box, the whole, everyone goes in the military and there is a, a culture of just innovation, breaking through any kind of conformity and find, there's, there's no no, there's no, there's, no, there's no problem without some solution. And there's just very creative people. They're very similar to the environment that I experienced when I live in California. Oh. There's, it's just clusters of very creative people that have the money and the time and the ability to freely do what they do best, you, you never know what's going to come out of the environment like that. That's why Hollywood's in California and IT's yeah. in California. So, I read on your brochure that you specialize in combining old-fashioned personalized medicine with the latest in technologies and treatments, and I think that's what almost all patients are truly looking for. But I think most physicians these days, just because they're so overwhelmed, are not able to actually deliver that. How are you able to do that? Well, yeah, most patients complain they wait hours to see their doctor, and then they don't see the doctor. They see some other provider that's working under the doctor. And um, I make the time to see every patient. Uh, 
when, when I trained in Israel, again, the British system is very traditional. There's years of being trained in good old-fashioned physical exam and just being able to look at a patient and see subtle changes in their eyes, in their earlobes, in their fingernails. All these can show that there's subtle little evidence of, in my case, coronary disease lurking, some mm -hmm. type of circulation problem. So it's a lot of looking at the patient. It's a lot of listening to the patient. There's, there's an old adage in medicine that the patient will give you the diagnosis. Um, what we were talking before about the classic presentations of, of, of angina, cardiac chest pain. Uh, a male patient comes to you and says, I used to play 18 holes of golf, and now at the ninth hole, I'm so winded and tired, I can't even get out of the golf cart anymore. Uh -huh. It's time for a cardiovascular exam. So it's, it's about looking, listening, and then being able to apply the right diagnostic modalities and then the right treatment plan. Can you tell us about some of the new technologies that might not be available yet, but that you're hearing about or that you're excited about um, that can help uh, the cardiology world? I would love to tell you that. Um, my, my hospital, Florida Medical Center, again, is part of the Tenant Florida Physician Services Heart and Vascular Network. So I'm affiliated with Delray Medical Center, which is sort of like the, the mothership of our, of our network of hospitals. Mm -hmm. They've collected a team of specialists that offer now in Delray the truly latest and greatest pioneering procedures that one would only find in places like Johns Hopkins, Harvard. Wow. So this is all available at Delray Medical Center. My ability to communicate with those physicians, get patients into our network, get them to Delray. The Delray physicians are more than happy to visit the patients at Florida Medical where I work. Mm -hmm. We really streamline the process, but we have access now to everything that's happening. All the latest trials in a minimally invasive non-surgical valve repair, something called the Watchman device, where we're actually putting a little net inside the heart to keep blood clots in the corners of the heart from getting out and flying to the brain. Wow. Um, little clips we can put in through little pokes in the leg that can clip weak valves back together. Ventricular assist devices, when patients have florid heart failure and their hearts are barely pumping, we can keep them alive with a small artificial heart. They can go home with it with a tiny little battery pack. And this can keep them alive for months until we see if their heart recovers or perhaps they need a cardiac transplant. Um, all the latest imaging, I have probably the best CAT scan machine in Broward County in my hospital. The pictures I get of the heart in 3D are done in two heartbeats. Patients have to hold their breath for maybe two seconds and uh -huh. we have a full 3D picture of the heart that we can manipulate on the computer screen, slice it up, look for, fly through the arteries like we're going through a tunnel and look inside and see where the blockages are. And that imaging modality is only getting more and more sophisticated. So I'm very proud to say that uh, the tenant network really gives the patients access to so many procedures that otherwise they literally would have to fly to the leading academic medical centers in the Northeast to have done. And uh, many, many of the typical community practitioners are not affiliated with doctors that are doing any of these procedures right now. And, and it's, it's the saddest thing for me to see is a patient that should have had one of these cutting edge, minimally invasive procedures. Mm -hmm. And I see someone sent them to a surgeon that did the good old fashioned, big incision, oh. open heart surgery, and, and they're recovering week after week in the ICU. We could have had them home in two or three days. Oh, that's heartbreaking. So really, as many patients as we can get, we want to get because we can truly offer them the most cutting edge cardiovascular procedures now that are out there patient, right here in South Florida. And they just don't need to get on a plane like they used to have to do. Absolutely not. We have the best minimally invasive heart surgeon works with me in my office, Dr. Eric Beyer. One of the best interventional cardiologists works with me in my office, Dr. Juan Velasquez. Wow. We sit in the same office together. I actually sit like this opposite Dr. Velasquez. We can talk about the patient's Together, we can go sit in a room and review all the imaging, all the films, discuss the patient together. This is so important. This is so good for the patient to have all the physicians allied using the same electronic medical record. Uh -huh. There's no need to repeat tests and bring records. If we can keep patients in our network, we can offer them a seamless one-stop shop for all their cardiovascular needs, which previously has, has really been unavailable anywhere in Florida. Will insurance cover some of these new tests? I would think if they're really, really new, insurance sometimes takes a while to catch up. Most of these 
to our experience, have been covered by most insurances. Okay. And once we justify a lot of the necessity of these procedures to the insurance companies, whether it will make the patient's length of stay in recovery be significantly less uh -huh. or uh, various other indications, we can usually get most things covered by most insurances. Nice. In your office, do you take most of the insurances? I take, through tenant, essentially everything. Oh, we, we have wow. a smorgasbord of insurances from the smallest capitated HMO plans to the biggest commercial plans. I, I think I take 28 insurances in my, in my office because tenant has such a power to negotiate with all the companies. So, If someone who's listening to our show tonight wants to either come to your office and make an appointment or wants to call in with any questions, how, what's the best way to get in touch? So my office is at the campus of Florida Medical Center, mm -hmm. and that's located at 3001 Northwest 49th Ave in Lauderdale Lakes, Florida, 33313. The phone number is 954-714-0686. And the website to all the TFPS cardiovascular doctors is www.tfpsdocs.com. Well, thank you, doctor. Um, I appreciate you joining us tonight. If our listeners have any additional questions, please feel free to give him a call. Uh, we've enjoyed having all of you, and uh, be sure and tune in next week. Thank you for having me. All right, it's been great. Thanks for listening and watching Stayin' Alive with Dana Hamill. Please join us next week when Dana brings another professional in the medical community who will tell us what they are currently working on to improve your quality of life. Follow Dana on Facebook at Stayin' Alive with Dana Hamill or visit her website, www.stayinalivewithdanahamill.tv. See you next week, and may you stay healthy. The opinions expressed on the preceding sponsored program were strictly those of its hosts, guests, and callers, and not necessarily those of this station, its staff, management, or sponsors.